can't hear anyone. Hello, is it better now? Can you hear us? Uh, Lalita, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Vikas. Uh, Sivan, you want to add this thing on chat, perhaps? So. Uh, Hi, Sibirin, are you able to hear us now? Is it better now? I can't hear you at all. I'm going to try and log in again. So absolutely. Is uh, everyone else able to hear us? If you can just uh, give us an answer in the chat box so that we know. Uh, all right, I can see. Ah, uh, yes. Now, now I... The social beat webinar. And we have a very interesting individual with us today. Uh, Simran Basin comes with about two, year, two decades of experience, and she's worked with various uh, brands across diverse consumer segments, uh, kids, youth, and luxury. And she's had earlier stints with Manipal Hotels and Britannia. And then she had an opportunity to relaunch a youth brand, which all of us uh, know and probably love, which is Fast Track. And that's when she really found her calling. Uh, and since early 2000, she spent time working on on that cohort of the audience, which is the youth. And she led the marketing team that conceptualized and built and ran the retail chain of Fast Track. And during that tenure, uh, you know, she did something unbelievable, which is took the entire revenue of the brand uh, even higher than their parent brand, which is Titan. So we'll probably hear uh, more about that shortly as well. Post that, she took on uh, the role of the CMO at Wildcraft and led the creation of that a vision of that brand and launched it nationally as well. And in 2016, she took the step of becoming an entrepreneur and uh, launched Brag, which is uh, possibly one of India's first and only young girl focused Innova brand uh, based out of Bangalore. Uh, so with that, a very, very warm welcome to Simran. Thank you so much, Vikas. And uh, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, uh, excited to sort of interact with um, uh, a whole bunch of you uh, um, and 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 sort of to to have more of a conversation uh, rather than a one-way monologue. So looking forward to it. Absolutely. So if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I also have my colleague Lalita here, who will be joining me in, in moderating the session. So welcome, Lalita, as well. Thank you. Hi, Lalita. Hi, Simran. Really Hi. excited to have this conversation with you today. Likewise. Great. So we'll start off simply. It'll be great to hear how the journey has been. And I know you, you've worked with iconic brands and you're, and you're trying to build an iconic brand yourself. How has the journey been over the last uh, two decades? Um, well, absolutely unforgettable. And um, I would say from day one, um, you know, a vertical learning curve. And that's, that's, uh, that's the way I realize I like it. Uh, you know, the, the moment the sort of curve and right now we all know about curves with the COVID virus and the stats that being throwing, right? Yes. Uh, it, forget flattening. The moment the curve starts reaching a sort of reducing rate of growth is when I know that I need to find uh, something to keep me challenged. And I think Fast Track was, um, was a perfect example of that because that's really where I began my career, right? After a couple of years of sales. Um, and I think Fast Track's growth was also because um, like me, the rest of us in the Fast Track team, uh, above us, below us, around us, were uh, felt similarly, right? That we weren't excited unless there was a vertical learning curve and we needed to do something different all the time. And, um, uh, you know, somewhere I think that that fits so well with the youth category, our internal restlessness and short attention spans uh, and, and what it takes to sort of challenge us that um, uh, sort of helped um, put that to the test in a brand like Fast Track and realize that, you know, if, when, you, when you live the brand, uh, it's just so much easier to build it, right? And, and that has been my single biggest learning um, that to be able to, you know, as a brand builder, it's most important to be able to connect with the brand, right? Uh, rather than looking at it as a marketer from the outside and saying, I'm going to research and try and understand the consumers, you've already created this wall, right? Right. You need I, to live I, it. 
absolutely you need, to live the brand. Yeah. you need to live it you need to find uh, and identify if there is some part of that brand in you that you connect to uh, and with that as a starting point i think um, yeah, you know is 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 where my journeys on every one of my brands have been absolutely fantastic uh, a part of me is fast track a part of me is wildcraft and a part of me is brag right these are all sort of parts of me and you know uh it 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 is what has made the journey so wonderful because as much as i have built these brands these brands have fed back into that part of me and built and honed those sides as well developed me really as a human being no oh, that's exciting i think they they built you as much as you built them that's uh, that's very exciting uh and also i think you know we will talk a bit about gen z as an audience and i think you know we'll go deep into that but one one point i want to step on here is all the brands that you worked with and right included are national brands right and and launching right. a brand and then taking it national it's it's not an easy task so you know yes. can you throw some light on how that happened what are some of the insights that work how did you really scale across across geographies and how does that work so i i think uh, you know the first principle you know for for any business or a a, a business that's led uh, by a brand under the aegis of a brand is to identify a universal business insight right um and uh, this universal business insight needs to be backed by a simple very simple and relevant product insight and brand insight right um and and these the the these things these insights coming together is what will give you the nationality or the scalability of the brand uh, you know across the country um and i'll i'll just use fast track as an example right uh, fast track was a sub brand of titan right but it was defined as a watch sub brand right uh, and therefore remained there till we decided to redefine it in 2003 when i came on board right. um and and i think what was amazing was you know that biju kurian when he was the coo of the watch division back then um you know it was a it was an open brief which basically said uh you know sort of figure out where fast track has to go because the the early avatar of fast track which was you know targeting the early jobber was really sort of um you know coming uh, coming to clash with titan sort of sort of down aging right. and titan becoming younger and younger and therefore what is the need for a brand like fast track if titan's already offering that right um and uh, um i i think the other thing that i remember him and manoj mentioning manoj tadipalli was the head of marketing is that look uh today fast track is targeting the early jobber right so you're 25 to 30 year old but uh back in 2000 in early 2000 there was this huge talk of you know more than 50% of india's population being below the age of 25 right yeah. so is there a space there right and with with these two sort of uh, guiding lights one started exploring now what can be done but it really started with uh, where fast track was then i really needed to get my hands dirty um you know whether it was walking the market and i had done two years of sales in titan already but this time i went back to the market to understand fast track and how fast track was selling and who it was selling to right so that whole journey really was what is wrong with fast track today with respect to let's say if i have to take this new lens of under 25 right and that became a reference point to uh, identify what all needed to be fixed and what all was not relevant right whether it was um, pricing right you're now looking at youth who work with pocket money your average price points of 1800 rupees back then uh were too expensive right yeah. could we crash this down to an average of 1200 rupees um uh, your uh, uh india's the uh, india's largest watch brand is titan and titan is generic to the category right so are the youth really looking for one more watch because my first watch was a titan watch right, right. and i loved it and for many of us i think yes yeah so and uh, and i was well well i was early 20s when i when i took on fast track right so in that sense i was still sort of in the uh, uh target group target group demographically but mentally certainly there right and um i thought to myself that what is going to force me as a consumer to consider another brand if the titan already has all these wonderful products right and that's where we you know we we started working on if we have to challenge right what is there in the watch category it has to be 
uh, by coming up with something that does not represent the category today or is not represented uh, not just in India, is there a way to do it with a with a product form that is not represented anywhere around the world, right? Um, so simultaneously started working on aspects of the brand to understand the consumer, right? If you're talking about youth and, you know, youth are uh, at 18, 19 is when we are all figuring out our identities, right? We are experimenting. We, we no longer believe we are kids as much as our parents and teachers would yes. like to treat us as such. Um, but the irreverence with which we the, the irreverence with which we are perceived is actually just us trying to break out and create our own identity right and the soul of that is what you know we said can we take that to watches right so if fast track has watches why does it need to look like a watch sure. right and that was the brief that went to the design team but a little before that when we were redefining we said what is the opportunity out there is it just for one more watch brand and the answer was no, there is no youth brand in the country, right? So we widened the definition and said the vision for Fast Track was really to become a head to toe lifestyle brand for the youth. Right? And was that, was that yeah. easy to do? I mean, you are in a, in a watch company and you, you go in and say, I'm going to make a whole bunch of products that you've never built before. And I know you mentioned before in other interviews that you were an entrepreneur in within the company, right? Would love right. to hear, was it easy to make that transition from watches to a lifestyle brand? Um, in a company like Titan, very easy because remember Titan was born in a printing press, right? Yes. And it was the watch company that launched Tanishq, right? And the watch company that launched Titan I Plus and Tanera Saris. So, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is in the blood of Titan and every Titanian there. Uh, I, I think that's the beauty of, you know, putting in place an organization like that, that gives you the freedom. If you so choose to take the baton and run with it, a company like Titan will allow you to do that. Right. So um, I, 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 I also think, you know, at that point of time, it was. Um, it was so small that it was easy to navigate it and say, this is where I can take it. Would it have been as easy if I were tasked with a, a similar exercise for Titan, the parent brand? Um, perhaps not, because there's so much else in terms of uh, history, right? Uh, so it, it always becomes easier to do that in either a new brand from scratch or a relatively small brand where the experimentation uh, will not affect the success or failure of, of that business, will not affect the fortunes of the company because it's a small contribution, right? So at that is reality. Yeah. Yes, yes. At the beginning, it's important to have that. Yeah. Simran, you also mentioned a very interesting point about uh, relevant product insights and, you know, how you uh, thrive on that insight to sort of build a brand or build a campaign. So just wanted to uh, ask you, how did those insights that you picked up along your journey with fast track and wildcraft and how did it help you bring build your own brand which is brag and it and it, it caters to a specific niche so i i think you know on on the product insight uh, you know firstly one has to be able to put oneself in the consumer's shoes right yeah. um and and i said uh, you know for for me for fast track it started with you know with watches and uh, you know then very quickly was able to expand to other product categories saying that if if one were to design for oneself and i think that's what everyone in the fast track team did right uh, we were team we were a team that were building a brand for ourselves um and uh, uh, including the designers so it's the marketing team that gave the brief to the designers that these are the kind of products that i want and the excitement came from um either building for that sort of young side of me or i'm still 18 and building for me right right uh, so in in brag also it it uh, um, it began there right um uh, my experience uh, you know as a uh, as a teenager uh, uh, sort of wearing bras, right? And and it is was, was something that was a very broken experience. I and and I still remember. It's only because my mother had a boutique, um, you know, and and had her own uh, 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 sort of tailoring outfit 
that I had kind of an okay experience because she took me to the market and said, come, we need to figure something out. I said, okay, mom. And we went, picked right. up this chemise, right? And, um, you know, she took it back and she said, okay, this is going to need changes. And she chopped it up and put an elastic through it. And hey, presto, you know, mom's version of a beginner bra for me was born, right? right. Uh, I really don't know what my friends did, right? But I also know that if she hadn't done that, uh, I, I wouldn't even have had, I, I would have had a very awkward growing up experience, right? right? And that awkwardness is what really impacts at that age, uh, you know, the teen years, uh, your confidence growing up, right? Mm -hmm. So that personal experience led to the why we wanted to do it a certain way. Um, also about the fact that at a very functional level, why did my mother need to do that? Because there were no age appropriate sizes available, Yeah. right? Um, and sort of putting that together, um, uh, you know, saying, okay, if it's about size, uh, my experience from, let's say, high school, right down till now as an adult woman, and I'm sure for every woman out there, you will relate to the fact that the bra is the single most uncomfortable garment any human being has to wear. Absolutely, okay. yes. And I challenge a man to find uh, a, a more uncomfortable <laughs> garment that they are treated to. Right. And uh, no offense meant because, but no uh, taken, yeah. <laughs> attempt wearing a bra and it's like putting yourself in armor for 18 hours a day. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's the thing about armor. Right. Uh, if, if it's too loose for you, it's clanking all over. And if it's too tight for you, it's digging into you. Well, that's what a bra is. It has to be perfect. Yeah. It has to be perfect. Yeah. Right. But how do you make something perfect for the human body? Because uh, uh, you know, the human body comes in infinite number of shapes and yeah. sizes. And you add to the, uh, that to, uh, uh, you know, to the mix um, with estrogen and hormones that only a woman's body deals with. And the monthly sort of cycle changes that forces your body measurements, especially your upper body to move up and down. And you have a, you have a mammoth task to be able to address comfort. Right. right. Uh, so we took comfort. We took, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, we took the age appropriate, not just design, but age appropriate communication and what mm -hmm. kind of a brand. I mean, do we all need to be Victoria's Secrets? Um, I have a young daughter. Right. And uh, uh, sort of being brought up, uh, um, you know, as I would say, as a fierce feminist. And I think LSR only sort of hones that further. There was this need to question that is this the only way that one needs to be or one needs to sell, right? And uh, Victoria's Secret, Secret has spanned brands across the world as imitators of that business model, right? And that's a business model built by men for men, right? Exactly. Men are sort of hapless sort of participants in that, right? Uh, so that really became the starting point, um, you know, to, to do what we've done, um, you know, with Bragg in the last four years. That's quite interesting, Sandrin. So what I would also like to understand is how did you go about building the story of Bragg? What is, if you had to define Bragg in, say, in less than 150 characters or just, you know, two, three lines, how would you put it? What is Bragg to you and what is Bragg for people out there? So I, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start with Bragg's vision. And this was a vision that, um, you know, sort of is very close to our hearts. Um, and both my, uh, uh, my business partner, Ivy Chin, and I are um, uh, we're friends from college. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, you know, putting this vision together was the most important and the first step, even before we sort of, uh, I think, quit our jobs, right? There needed to be this war cry that drove us and drove our passion to be able to do what we wanted to do. And that was um, a vision that says to bring girls out of the closet and onto the streets, right? And when we put that phrase out there, there was a little arrow uh, uh, above closet uh, to bring uh, to, uh, after girls, to bring girls in a way out of the closet and onto the streets, right? So again, the definition of the business was much uh, wider but beginning with Innerware, because that's really where we began. We believe that, um, uh, you know, sort of the whole, the whole cultural gender story begins. Right. Right? Yeah. So challenging that was very critical for us. 
uh, to bring girls out of the closet, to bring their inner wear out of the closet meant we needed to challenge the product stereotype, challenge the business model stereotype, um, and of course, challenge the gender stereotype which, with which you package the brand. And all of it has to be very closely linked together. Uh, and that was really the beginnings of, of where Bragg began. So uh, that's a good segue into our next question, Simran, is how did it all begin, right? And I think Bragg as a name as well for an Innova brand is quite ironic. So it will be good to understand how did that name come about and how have the last four years been, right? What have been some of the key hits and misses uh, from a business perspective and from a marketing and brand perspective as well? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, it's interesting that you, um, uh, you know, you asked that because uh, I think... Uh, you know, where we began, um, and, I, and, and you talked about the name Bragg, right? Uh, I remember testing this name, um, uh, and incidentally, the name, the name came up uh, several years before Bragg was born and before we turned entrepreneurs. Right. Um, I had just had my daughter. She was one. This was 2011. Uh, my partner had just had her twins about a year before that. Um, so we were kind of balancing sleepless nights and work. And uh, I think it was one of these feverish uh, days that I had taken sick leave, but I kind of woke up with this epiphany of what we must do next. And I say specifically we, because the first thing I did with that epiphany was pick up the phone and call up Ivy and uh, say, I figured out what we need to do next, right? And she was always sort of, we were, you know, we were, we've been sort of this sisters in, in entrepreneurial crime since way before, because both of us come from entrepreneurial families, right? right. Um, what was very clear were two things in that epiphany, uh, a youth brand uh, of innerwear called Bragg, right? And uh, Bragg jumped in because of, um, you know, the, the fearlessness with which we believe uh, we need to be able to speak, right, as young women. Uh, and we need to inspire young women to be able to do the same. And that's also a part of getting out of the closet, right? And it's very closely linked with the product category that today is, uh, is still a taboo. Uh, there are people uncomfortable saying the word bra, right? Forget about anything else, right? Uh, and uh, uh, including things like your bra strap is sticking out. Some well-meaning woman will come up to you and say, you know, yes. it's either your mother or your grandmother. In my case, it has also been colleagues working around me have come up and said, Simran, put it in and, you know, like be mindful of yourself, right? Um, so it, it's, it, I, I think as, as a gender, we're very sort of, you know, we're, 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 we're supposed to be a certain way, stay within this little circle that has been created for us. And we ourselves force ourselves to stay within that, right? Um, so Bragg fit in there, you know, this fearless sort of vocalization of what you want to say, whether it is softly, internally to yourself or loudly, that's the choice you have, right? When we tested this name, a couple of people told us um, that, you know, why would you choose a name like Bragg? It has negative connotations and uh, it won't work for a feminine category like lingerie, right? Uh, that was when Ivy and I decided that Bragg it is. <laughs> That's the very reason why it is. <laughs> exactly why it is, right? We went through the motions of testing the other names out, but our minds were made up. Uh, we went through the process. And I think as we went through the process, every response we heard, right, um, from the marketers and from the adults was, Bragg doesn't work. You know, they would go into mental masturbation of the other names, right? And an analysis paralysis of why the other names work. But interestingly, there were a bunch of uh, 12, 13 year olds who we had, you know, in, in the room with this sort of focus group, we were throwing bralettes at them and we had these young girls and their moms. So the moms were talking about, you know, the meaning of the word and so on and so forth. And one of the girls piped up and said, brag. And the mom said, why? And she said, it's short, it's simple, it just connects. And that was it. And I'm like, that's how consumers are. They aren't complicated. We marketers yeah. make consumers <laughs> complicated and therefore we make our decisions complicated. We make the whole research process complicated, right? Um, uh, it, it just captured everything in that one simple thought 
what we wanted to do, what the consumers took out of it without necessarily being able to articulate it the way as a marketer I expected to be articulated. No, well, right. that's very rare, I would say, right? And from day one to build that connect, no, that's fantastic. And, and how have the last four years been, Simran, in terms of the business and brand? Uh, you know, how, where do you think you've come in the last four years? So I, I think, uh, you know, what, what we set out to do uh, very clearly, and this was important for Ivy and me, both of us were, you know, uh, really at the top of our game. I was chief marketing officer of Wildcraft. Ivy was uh, chief financial officer of uh, GE's Asia Pacific uh, division of their water business. Um, it needed to be something that really meant something to us. And we put that down firstly as legacy, right? Uh, we will do this because we want to leave a legacy behind um, and we will do it because we want to be able to impact a large number of people, right? Now that definition of impact has changed and fine-tuned along the way, uh, but it started with can we impact women uh, um, and, and specifically became young girls because we are smaller size than the average women out there, right? And I hope nobody is turning pink and purple on the other side of the screen. But yes, I, I don't think there's anything wrong in talking about uh, breasts and breast sizes, and neither should any of you be, right? Um, so it became about small size women. And then we said, if the scale of impact has to be larger, uh, uh, should it be younger women? Because there is an opportunity in the youth, and that's something I've, I've, I have witnessed uh, firsthand. Uh, but all women are small before they become large, right? So that scale immediately, the scale of impact became important. How we impacted was uncovered, I would say literally day by day over the last four years, because while it started with, can we have really cool looking bras? Um, and the word comfort was a little lower in, in priority, where comfort became much higher in priority when we realized that as, as women, uh, the word comfort doesn't exist in our vocabulary when, when with, ref with reference to what we wear, right? And one part of it is stiletto shoes, right? Yeah. And that's what Clarks is trying to solve, uh, you know, for. Um, but we've decided to focus on the bra and comfort, right? And it is linked so closely to um, how we're brought up as young women, right? You're not taught to think of your comfort first. You're taught to think of how you will be perceived, right? Uh, in the way you speak, in the way you look, in the decisions you take, and whether you have children or not, whether you're married or not, and so on and so forth, right? Um, now, it has been a vertical learning curve because our own understanding of how we can impact has changed every few months, right? And it helped us fine tune it became a, I would say, a larger and larger war cry for us. It also helped us uncover how large the barriers are if we were to go ahead and actually deliver on this impact, right? Uh, and and I, I will now sort of lead into what some of the hits and misses have been for us through that journey and the learning of this all, right? Um, I would say the first thing is we grabbed attention, right? Uh, and I will come down to, you know, one of the, the most important parts as a business where we needed to grab attention is, you know, we, we were clear we were not going to start off as a direct to consumer brand, right? And that we would be offline and 95% of India shops for innerwear in stores, physical stores, yes. right? Today, no longer. And the game has changed and I'll come to that. But um, top retailers across 25 cities opened their doors to us, Right. Uh, we knew we were onto something uh, because Indian businessmen and especially retailers uh, across Indian, uh, India are some of the toughest nuts to crack, right? They have this instinct for where they can make money and where they can't and where the gaps are, right? And yeah. uh, uh, often, and I, I remember being on the other side, you know, as a company like Titan or sort of many other companies. When, you, when you're doing sales calls, you'll go to the market and they'll tell you, Aap ye ni introduce karte? right? And that is their understanding of money can be made. Consumers are asking for this. Uh, can some brand give me this? Right? Yeah. Now, nobody had given it to them in the way that they felt. And they felt Bragg was, had the opportunity to do that. 
And when they met IV and me, because we used to do uh, sales calls on our own before we hired a team, there was a brag, uh, bag of bras on our shoulder and we would walk in and present the range, you know, uh, literally going store to store to top retailers. Uh, so that was, you know, I think one of the first things that told us that we were on to something and they would articulate it as much and also tell us that, look, you have X brand and Y brand that has got bits of this and bits of that. But the way you want to do it and the vision that you're sharing, because we didn't have everything uh, uh, up immediately, right? So we would share a vision of where we want to go and where we're beginning. That validation came from them and was a huge plus. It led the way for us to build the business, right? right. Um, I think a second part, which was more like an ego win, uh, was when we knew very early in the first year itself, uh, we started hearing from many places that leading offline and online brands had us on their radar, right? Okay. They start, started tracking us and, you know, we said we're on to something. We, we need to be quick about this. And as an entrepreneur and as a startup, I think that's what all of us know. We know speed is of the essence, right? Um, one of the interesting hits was an unintended hit, right? We were targeting the teen, right? right. But we realized our largest selling product uh, and our most successful selling product was also was actually being worn by tweens, right? Sure. So there were there were girls as young as eight and nine wearing our products, and when we and we would go personally to you know conduct product trials and meet with the mums, right? It's a very it's a very awkward conversation, um, you know, product trials and things. So we would do this personally, and when we realized one of our biggest consumers had some twelve brags in her product. Uh, in, in her wardrobe and she was eight years old, we started the conversation right, right. to understand why. And then we realized this tween market is actually lower hanging fruit. While we still believe that the role for brag is to, to bring in comfort wear and to really, you know, give, be the most comfortable option to the bra. Um, here is an opportunity to impact at a stage where young girls won't have a benchmark their minds and bodies have not yet been sullied by habits that, you know, society forces upon them, right? And uh, that's when we created Miss Bragg, our sub-brand, right? Uh, I would say this was a year into our launch, so about 2017. End right. 2017 is when we conceptualized Miss Bragg, which was the beginner bra line uh, for tweens, right? Uh, that took off. We didn't even need to market nothing. It was just a packaging story. And within the sort of the whole uh, uh, larger parent of Bragg, Miss Bragg took off and very quickly contributed to 80% of our revenues. Right? Wow, nice. Um, uh, uh, coming to some of the misses, right? The other learning along this journey uh, was that the teen is already wearing a bra, right? And has already, so to speak, been uh, habituated to the conventional bra. And in that sense, habituated to discomfort, right? right? Now to get her to change her mind and actually realize that what she is wearing is actually uncomfortable is a far taller task, right? Than getting a young girl who has not worn anything before to actually begin wearing something that is already comfortable within her world. Right? So switch, switching is, is a bigger challenge. Yeah. Switching is a very, very big challenge, right? And Bragg, the parent brand and the whole product line under Bragg, which was uh, bralettes for adult women, right? And most people think that bralettes are only for young growing girls uh, or small size women. That's not the case. Bralettes are just a more comfortable option to a bra, right? Light, lightweight, soft, um, you know, adaptable, unstructured versus the structured conventional bra. Um, we realized that value proposition did not work for that age group with the monies that we were putting behind it and with the product proposition that we were taking. There were too many barriers we were coming up against. It was cultural. So there were girls who were loving what the products looked like. They looked like bikini tops and, you know, they wanted to wear it. But once they wore it, even though it was a product that needed to be worn, that, that is worn by and large under your clothes, right? So it's completely covered up. But the fact that they were, uh, let's say, plunging necklines as a very specific thing, 
most girls and women were uncomfortable wearing plunging necklines because when you look at yourself in a mirror is that the kind of woman or girl i am in my head forget anyone seeing me, right right so a lot of very strong cultural nuances like this would come up in conversations including things like um you know how is this bra fitting during a product trial session um how is it looking simran and i would say no i want you to shut your eyes and tell me how you feel <laughs> are you feeling comfortable right there was no answer to that no i just want you to tell me how this looks right right such an external driven purchase process right uh yeah. it needs huge monies and i i i think we know what acts had to do when they had to change behavior right from from talcum powder to deodorants right um uh, i know how much money it took for fast track to change behavior with sunglasses in a country yeah. where you know 99% people out in the sun don't see the relevance of wearing a pair of sunglasses <laughs> right yeah. it takes huge amounts of money so that has been a big learning for us and something that we know uh, and and started changing and has have moved to let's say launching a new product line right um uh, but had we understood that uh, earlier in our journey perhaps all the the marketing monies that we and and the resources that we had put behind the first avatar of the brag product line if we had put it behind the next avatar perhaps that would have been a different journey uh uh that would have led us to a different place where we are today right but having said that these were sort of uh, uh you know huge learnings for us and some of the things that really worked for us and some things that we really we had to very quickly move to change right no absolutely thanks for candidly sharing that sibran i think great to understand the learnings and i think the journey has just begun in some sense so it's great to see that uh one question also on your distribution right and i know you have a direct to consumer a website where you sell directly but like you rightly said 90 to 95% of sales still happen offline how has covid impacted that and how has the distribution changed in the last 3 months vis-a-vis -vis previously radically changed right and um, it it is i i say this with some amount of confidence now because over the last 12 months uh iv and i went about um, uh, sort of moving from a predominantly offline brand to a predominantly online brand right and right. for a host of reasons which i won't get into now but um uh, we started organically building our own understanding of how we were to sell and not in the direct to consumer uh, uh uh format because that takes a lot of monies right and one of our learnings was that we put in too much of monies into our product proposition that didn't work well so we had to figure out organically how to do it right right uh, so we did it on third party portals and started building slowly a business on um a, a platform like amazon right and while we are also there on sort of uh, uh, zivami and uh, uh, mintra and flipkart um we we always saw that we were able to control our fortunes on amazon versus the variables the macro variables we we dealt with and continue to deal with on the other platforms were not entirely under our control right, right. Uh, in that sense amazon is very democratic it puts the you know it puts the control in the hands of the seller and the brand um so very steadily started organically building our business on amazon and uh eventually it became sort of 30% of our business i would say by december last year or jan this year when we began um we also got added on to the amazon launchpad platform nice. um which means amazon had identified us as a business and brand that had found a niche that could be cracked open into a mass opportunity right and that came on just before covid hit right but uh being let's say an amazon prime brand being an amazon launchpad brand meant we had very gradually also reached a stage where our stock was sitting in the amazon warehouse at least one one large part of it right sure. so when the lockdown came everything else shut down right there was zero business for the month of april right we were all sort of holding our head in our hands saying our our even our strategy our nimble strategy of trying to change is now sort of the rug has been pulled out from below our feet right but when unlock one happened and e-commerce started being able to deliver again um 
Amazon opened up slowly, right? And within the month, so I would say May month, Amazon alone uh, went back to pre-COVID sales of Amazon, right? It took a lot of the other players and they're still struggling with sort of, I think, getting their logistics into place uh, yes. and perhaps brag within those logistics didn't, uh, um, you know, didn't, didn't address as much of a gap as we seem to have now addressed on Amazon, right? Uh, and without us doing anything, because we even pulled off marketing monies on Amazon, right? Without us doing anything, it's like a tap opened, right? Which is fantastic, uh, yeah. Uh, having said that, it is, I'm also very mindful of the fact that uh, what COVID has done has taken a lot of other players out of the equation who have not been able to address the logistical challenge, right? Uh, including us, right? But we got lucky with so much of stock sitting in the Amazon warehouse where we didn't need to worry, can I get my warehouse open or right. not? Uh, can my retailers open their stores or not? Uh, and that started selling on its own, right? So today, of course, our challenge is how do we make sure we get stock to Amazon in time? Uh, and we're still challenged by the fact that our, our vendor partners perhaps aren't able to even to open their, their, their factories to be able to produce, right? Um, but uh, um, one of the reasons why our business as Amazon has grown is the reason why businesses online are growing today much faster because COVID has forced us to change our behavior. And we were not willing to change this behavior before because as human beings, we prefer to stay in our comfort zones for as long as we possibly can. As, until you're pushed towards the wall, yeah. Until you're pushed towards the wall and that's what COVID has done, right? So we see people who have never shopped online before shopping online, right? Forget buying innerwear, right? They're, they're newbies and having tasted the convenience of buying online, it has opened their eyes to being able to buy anything online. Absolutely, yeah. Right. And I think with, with all of us being at home, even I've realized how much more I can shop online than I used to before, right? And you exactly. can pretty much get everything yeah, online. Yeah. So. No, and, and even the whole barrier of, you know, will I get the right size and all of that? Now you don't have an option. You can't go yeah. out. So I'm happy to wait for, let's say, Mintra to go back and forth three times before I find my right size. And through that process, I've understood which size I need to buy which brand, if I buy from that brand and the same size, it will fit me now that barrier in my head is removed. Uh, it's just been a very rapid learning for us as consumers, right? And brands like us have benefited from that because we had one leg, one foot in the door. Sure. So Simran, uh, we'd also like to understand you all, all, all spent a lot of time understanding the youth and the Gen Z and what their preferences are, what they're after, and they're always after the next big thing, the next new thing. So just want to understand what, according to you, are the key drivers of, uh, you know, building that brand image in, 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 in the minds of the youth and what, what helped brag become a brand of choice amongst them? So, uh, you know, firstly, uh, I, I think building brands is not just about identifying a demographic and we tend to get caught up in this trap of identifying an age segment, right? Um, I, would, I would urge us to look at mindset, right? Uh, in the context of the age segment, right? Um, today, youth brands, for example, uh, uh, include a brand like Diesel and Levi's, uh, uh, and my dad wears Levi's at 78, right? Uh, who's to tell him that he is not young, right? Uh, he's young at heart and he believes Levi's addresses what he needs. And if he lives in jeans, he lives in Levi's, right? Um, so the point that I'm making is, uh, it's the mindset of the youth. And in Fast Track, we defined it as the... And, and I would say, let's say if, if as a generic youth brand, you would, you would define it as the, you know, the, the fountain of youth, right? And you can capture it as saying, you know, I'm forever 21 or forever 18. Uh, but in Fast Track, we coined the phrase, the campus mindset, right? Because that mindset does exist in older generations and younger generations. 
but the center of gravity of that mindset is where it's in yeah. the campus right yeah. um so you know if you if you get stuck only with age you can tend to go uh, uh still too wide and not be a sharply defined brand and i do believe that only brands that are sharply defined brands will become larger businesses tomorrow because as consumers we are sharpening our awareness and understanding of ourselves right and the more choices consumers are getting across a plethora of brands within every segment we are being we are being able to make choices that are closer to our self image and our particular unique needs right and i think for gen z one of the particular unique uh 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 things about them is that uh they're extremely um i think there's an authenticity and an honesty to that consumer um where uh it's not as much about posturing right and you you do have a lot of posturing across many consumer segments but uh this is the generation that is becoming very aware about everything from let's say sustainability to um a uh, sort of uh, gender sensitivity to um uh um uh, uh, to democracy uh, yeah. and and you can apply it across across you know anything when when they consume content when they consume brands when they partake in decisions they are much more opinionated than previous youth generations absolutely right? i think they 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 are much more aware than the older audiences today because of the popularity of the social uh, media channels and the sort of information that's being disseminated on these channels right. which also right. sort of brings me to the next question so up until now tiktok was a phenomenon in the country and now with the ban of tiktok how do you think uh, you know we can tackle the gap and address the needs of the young generation on digital platforms um so firstly one reality check right every time a government has come to ban anything it has become larger than it was before <laughs> think of the alcohol the ban fruit. in gujarat yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so the forbidden uh, fruit i i so, yeah. i'm just going to leave that thought out in your yes yes A- absolutely <laughs> right so if, if we want to impact anything the worst thing that we can do is to ban it because <laughs> if it is working so well with consumers they will find a way now of course it's left to be seen whether tiktok the brand finds its way but consumers will find a way to get what tiktok was giving to them if tiktok Absolutely. manages to address that they will do it through that otherwise consumers will find a way to get it from whatever is the latest avatar of snapchat or whoever else is in the wings or whether facebook is waiting with their sort of version of uh, 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 tiktok and the newer formats that are coming up every day right i can see on instagram newer formats uh, uh, being bounced i mean there's there's just so much that's happening of uh, uh, spotify as a marketer today we're looking at spotify to figure out how one can use you know um, audio to market to consumers right in a, in a way that radio couldn't do right in an offline avatar so um i i wouldn't worry uh, if tiktok isn't around for us marketers right uh uh incidentally today uh, newspapers are not around as well i mean today you are able to buy uh, uh newspaper media at a significant discount right a lot of tv channels the media is is far more affordable today to many more marketers and brands simply because everyone uh, uh you know is has has started watching uh, uh so many ott channels which are your netflixes of the world uh and we have discovered that that fewer of us are on regular tv and suddenly the tv chance are scrambling for how to get these how to get these guys to watch me when i have no new content to share no right? absolutely and i think so uh, um, it, it, it there's a lot of change underway and um we have to keep experimenting not necessarily waiting for a platform a media platform to present itself saying use me to reach out to your target audience but why can't we as brands become the next to create the next media platform ourselves right uh, uh, how many brands have strong digital communities out there right 
can you use those digital communities? Can you create sort of new digital products that are part of your portfolio um, that can reach out to consumers? Um, I, I mean, look at the Nike Run Club, right? And look at the Nike Run app, right? Uh, uh, so I, I think we need to redefine the way we looked at how do I reach consumers and our entire go-to-market strategy and uh, open up and sort of move away all the assumptions that we have been uh, taught uh, uh, either through our business schools or through our experiences, right? Until we remove those blinkers away and say, now anything is possible. You start brainstorming with that approach and you'll be surprised with the ideas that you can come up with. Oh, fantastic, Simran. So we'll take some questions uh, from the audience. I think there are quite a few. Uh, there, I think there's one common question coming in from uh, Arjun, Vishaka, and Tamanna. It's about Ms. Brad and about the difference between the user here, which is the tween, and possibly the decision maker, who's possibly the mom or the parent, right? So is, how do you tackle that communication challenge and who do you communicate to and what do you communicate? Um, okay, so uh, uh, I would say a very, very valid point. And there are many brands and categories that, uh, you know, go through this challenge as well. Um, it's the mother who's opening the wallet. It is also the mother in this case, compared to any other category, uh, who is introducing the consumer to the product, right? And today's mother, uh, mothers like me, who are extremely uh, mindful of the fact that we do not want our daughters to have the same horrific experience we had growing up, right? And can we bring, make their growing up less awkward, right? So the communication to the mother is about that, right? How can we make growing up for your daughter more fun and less awkward, right? And can we, in fact, for us, it has also become a lot of one-to-one -one communication and direct consumer uh, communication to mothers uh, about how um, they shouldn't worry if the daughters don't really want to wear a beginner bra, right? Because they're putting their own fears on their daughter, right? right. Now, when we talk from, as a mother to a mother, uh, the connect is very different. The reassurance and trust they feel is very different, right? But this communication is not overt, right? This communication happens through a different channel. Um, uh, and, and for that purpose, we opened a separate Instagram page for Miss Bragg, which targets the mothers, but from the voice of the girl, right? So this was a very, uh, it, it, was a, uh, it was the voice of a girl who's saying my, um, you know, here's what my mom did for me and why I, why I loved it so much, right? So it was a very careful balance. Um, and um, uh, I think it was important to say we can't talk only about and talk only to the mother because young girls today have an opinion on their own. My daughter stopped wanting me to choose what she was wearing when she was three, <laughs> right? Uh, today she is she's eight, okay? Uh, uh, they do have a say in what they want to do and a very strong vocal say right? As a brand, if we forget that we are lost to the generation, we will only be bought or used by them as long as their mothers can control them. The minute the mother loses control and the daughter throws a fit saying, I'm not wearing brag because my mother has told me to wear it, we are done for, right? So for youth brands, this is a very fine balance, right? Um, uh, for the younger audience of tweens, and for an innerwear category, this was the way we played it out for, uh, uh, for Bragg and for Miss Bragg. For Fast Track, we didn't consider the parent at all. Absolutely, yeah. Right? Uh, again, there, the mother or father is the one pulling out, right? Because there's pocket money. And pocket money is not you can go and buy a 2,000 rupee watch on your own, right? Without your mom saying, yes, you can. Um, so it is still the mother and father coming to uh, purchase. Um, but there the teen has a much, much stronger worth. So it's single-handedly talking only to the teen. So I think for every brand, every category, depending on the nuances you face, you will have to balance. How do you reassure the parent that their money is well spent? In Fast Track's case, it was because it came from the house of Titan. You know, you know it's a quality product. 
but I, I don't think the average pa parent was very happy when they saw our advertising for fast track and you know yeah. were okay with sort of condoning you know uh, uh, you know their their son or daughter to enter the world of fast track but the kids pull was very very strong there no absolutely uh, we have a lot of questions we'll try and take some more several uh, sure. one of them is around very specific to the category is about victoria secret and how tamanna who's who's a participant feels that Uh, they're they're on their way down and not really succeeding, especially because of the competition with Savage and Fenty by Rihanna. Uh, Fenty by Rihanna. So, yes, what's yes. your take on all these brands, and how how do you think Victoria's Secret can bounce back? You know, so before Savage Fenty came along, uh, there was Airy. Airy is uh, American Eagles' uh, teen innerwear sub brand, right? Uh, Airy is the one that made the bralette big in the in the U.S. Right? Um, it made Victoria's Secret sit up and take notice in such a, a, a strong way that it forced Victoria's Secret to launch bralettes. Now imagine the brand that has given us the underwire and the push-up bra, right? And I said that the only way to wear a bra is this way is now going to a comfortable, unstructured format. Right, that's how hard Airy hit them, right? And it, it was a consumer that took Airy and said, "But this is what I've been asking for," and started rejecting Victoria's Secret. Of course, it was more the popular opinion that became larger before Airy's business became larger. Savage Fenty followed that, right? And it is that same voice that uh, uh, you know is is I think for women's products. uh um uh trickling down across the world but you're absolutely right victoria secret is struggling and being battered from all angles having said that they still have a sizable business because their insight is still rooted in truth for some consumers right um but over a period of time the moment you have brands like airy and savage fenty giving you an option right either an option of a brand whose self image aligns with yourself or a brand whose product just appeals to you more because it suddenly opened your eyes to a different way that one can consume and use products uh brands like victoria secret that do not heed this uh you may not see it right but when it starts bubbling up if you're not going to heed this and do something about it you will face a much larger backlash as you go along We have another interesting question, Simran, uh, from sure. Padi, and uh, she's asking. You spoke about the human body coming in definite shapes and sizes. Is there a right. particular reason why Brad's website is featuring only a specific sizes models? And how do you manage to connect with the with uh, the girls who are on the heavier side? I'm so glad you've asked this question, and uh, it's 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 going to allow me to tell you of the struggles we've had. right um we've always looked for a healthy body right the models out there uh, and we always wanted uh, you know a global indian face right we said we and i'm definitely not a proponent of i'm an international brand i must hire these sort of blonde haired blue eyed models right and you'll find a lot of brands in india do that because yes. we are we are hung up on sort of uh, uh, foreign goods and foreign right. brands right versus desi right desi is honestly a mindset right um firstly in innerwear as a category and lingerie in particular right 95% or more of models in india refuse to do it because culturally it is not condoned to be a lingerie model Right, yeah. uh, because of the whole Victoria's Secret sort of uh, typification, right? Uh, we wanted Indian girls. We wanted girls who looked real uh, and and weren't photoshopped, and we couldn't find them because models weren't existing. And beyond, actually, we didn't even start with models. We wanted girls who weren't models, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was a bigger challenge then because modeling itself was something that was out of their realm. and for them to think of modeling innerwear was a larger thing so that closed one door for us indian models got closed with this one part that if we got left with a small 5% pool that small pool charges 
significantly higher, almost double in some cases, the moment you are a lingerie brand, right? So there was this one conversation we had where it was okay if you're a bralette, if you're shooting only for bralettes, uh, we're fine. But uh, um, the moment you want us to wear a panty also, which makes you then a lingerie brand, um, our charges will go up, right? How are we as a startup to be able to afford that, right? Now, um, with, with our first campaign, we struggled so much that we were forced to say, okay, let's let go of the Indian bit. Let us first demonstrate the brand we want to be in terms of at least voice and attitude, right? Okay. So the young girls you see on our first campaign uh, are girls from across the world. Because again, we did not want to sort of just take on, let's say the Western notion of beauty, right? Um, uh, and we had a mix there, but it was important for us to choose girls who uh, represented that attitude, right? That helped us convince some Indian models to say, okay, you're not another Victoria's Secret and you don't need to be embarrassed to be associated with us, right? right. Uh, and our next campaign, we managed to get an Indian model, right? But we wanted to move beyond model. We wanted to get to regular Indian girls, right? Uh, we managed to get a little closer to that in our next campaign. But to me, here's the problem, right? Today, you go to modeling agencies, and I have gone blue in the face rejecting models because they conform to a stereotype um, of skin color, of hair color, of body shape and size, right? Including brands today, and I don't want to bring up names because they are partners uh, of mine, but e-commerce portals, when they give you guidelines, and for those of you who are marketers, pull out the e-commerce guidelines, the shoot guidelines of <laughs> any random e-commerce yeah. portal. Yeah. They're one of them mm -hmm. who even says only international models and we forced them to change that in the contract with us. We said Bragg will not sign up with you if you are going to insist on this clause that when we put up our products, they will only be on international models. We may be constrained to not be able to find Indian models. Right. But the whole thought of that is what goes against the grain. Right. So it's a very large change we need to make as an industry. And I think us marketers need to influence that if we are going to build brands with international models because they look like they're American or European, uh, we are creating demand only for that. And then the supply will be only that. Right. Uh, it became very easy to tackle this as, as a brand uh, uh, that had money is like fast track, right? And if you ask anyone, you know, on, on the fast track team back then, and they would say, we want the global Indian look. We don't want this sort of foreign for the sake of foreign look. Sure. Yeah. No, I think fascinating, Simran. I think the questions are still pouring in. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, but I think I would love to kind of have one final thought from you in terms of, you know, anyone out there who's trying to build a brand for Gen Z. You know, I think there have been a lot of questions also around, if you really have a purpose in mind, how do you bring that to life for your brand? And I think you've, you've done that very beautifully. So any closing thoughts on, on that? Simran? You know, so out of all the marketing templates that uh, we've been taught and we work with as marketers, uh, the, the, the simplest one is uh, uh, the golden circle by Simon Sinek, right? Where there's just three concentric circles and the, the center circle is the why, right? Um, spend the most time as a marketer answering the why of your brand, right? And the why of your brand in the context of whichever target audience or consumer you're working with, uh, that is what will give you your purpose, right? And if you can find your purpose uh, is strong enough as a purpose uh, within your target audience, you have a way to connect. And if you connect, that connect is what will give you your starting point for your product uh, and your communication and your packaging and what you will do. And most importantly, a long list of what you will not do because that is what helps fine tune and make sharper brands some of the most iconic brands have been built on this principle and it's not complex, right? So if all the other marketing templates are befuddling you to answer those various questions, pull out Simon Sinek's why 
and just answer those three questions, but focus on the center one. Fantastic, Simran. I don't think there's any better way to close the session. Thanks so much for spending time with us and sharing candidly your journey and also sharing what brands should be doing in this uh, challenging yet exciting times. And thanks again for joining us. And uh, for everyone out there, please do leave your feedback. We do 